Good evening and welcome to tonight's program. Uh, my name is Sam Ankerson. I'm the executive director of the Bailey Matthews National Shell Museum and thank you very much for joining us in for what is now the third lecture in our celebrating 25 years lecture series and tonight's program, uh, Oysters, a Crystal Ball for Water Quality in Southwest Florida. Uh, we also thank Dr. Melissa May for presenting uh, tonight's program and sharing her important new research and perspective on changing water quality in the region, and in particular, how these changes impact um, mollusks such as oysters. Melissa is an assistant professor of marine biology at Florida Gulf Coast University. She has been studying the effects of environmental stress on marine mussels since 2010. She earned her PhD from the University of Maine and following a postdoctoral research fellowship at California Polytechnic State University, joined the faculty of the Water, Water School at Florida Gulf Coast University uh, in August 2020. Uh, since joining, she's been very busy. She uh, began an oyster monitoring program in Estero Bay and uh, has re reached out um, almost immediately to partner with organizations in the area, including the Shell Museum and also our neighbors at Sanibel Captiva Conservation Foundation, with whom she conducts some of her research um, on their research vessel and marine labs. Um, here at the Shell Museum, Melissa has been instrumental in helping us to relaunch a summer internship program. And we currently have two terrific uh, FGCU undergrad interns uh, working in the museum this summer in the aquariums and with visitors at the touch pools. So Melissa, in addition to everything else, thank you for that. Um, a couple of notes um, before we begin. Um, if you could uh, make sure to mute your microphones, that would be appreciated. Uh, if you have questions during the program or after the program, please use the chat function um, to type in your questions. So move your cursor along the, the bottom of the screen, type in your questions on chat. I will, um, uh, I will monitor those and uh, we will do a question and answer session at the end of the program. And uh, also be sure to join us for our next lecture in the series, which is going to be two weeks from today, Tuesday, July 27th. Our own uh, senior marine biologist at the museum, Rebecca Mensch, will present on supersized squid. Um, Becca is an expert on, um, on giant squid and she will share new discoveries about colossal and giant squid um, that answer some of some questions about, um, some long running questions about these most enigmatic creatures of the deep. So that's um, coming up in two weeks. It's a free program, will also be on Zoom and you can register for it at uh, Shell Museum. Dot org. We plan soon to announce uh, another, uh, another group of online lectures um, that will um, extend from August through October. And uh, beginning in November, we are planning to, hoping to um, restart uh, lectures here at the museum, but also include an online um, component to those as well. So stay tuned for all of that. So thank you again for joining us. And it is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Melissa May of Florida Gulf Coast University. Hi, uh, thank you. Thank you, Sam. And thank you all for coming. Um, so as Sam mentioned today, I'm gonna be talking um, a little bit about the research I've been doing at FGCU over the last year. Most of it's gonna be focusing um, on Estero Bay, but I'll talk a little bit about the work if I have time um, that I've been doing with um, SCCF. So most of the talk we're gonna be thinking about, or I'll be focusing on um, why I'm kind of interested in studying oysters in Estero Bay. And to kind of get to that, we'll talk about what oysters are, even though I'm <laughs> assuming you all probably already know, um, why they're important and more particularly, um, what types of things stress them out. So just kind of as a preface, again, I'm a marine biologist. So I've been studying bivalves for about 10 years. Um, and like Sam said, mostly my focus has been on mussels and particularly how they respond to stress um, in the context of climate change. So 
a lot of the work I do is molecular. So I look at like whether their genes or proteins are changing under different stressful conditions like extreme temperatures or low salinity or even lack of food. Um, and then using that for early signs of stress um, more before they like start to die off. Um, so because I'm new to FGCU, we're trying to apply some of this work to oysters. So some of my initial work has just been trying to figure out what's actually going on here um, so that we can cont continue to build on that and look at them on a much smaller scale in the future. So what are oysters? Um, again, I'm sure most of you guys are familiar with them. They're a bivalve mollusk. Um, so they're similar to the gastropods, so most of the shells that you guys are probably a little bit more interested in. Um, and one of the things that um, is similar similarity between them is the presence of this tissue, which is known as the mantle. So the mantle tissue is this outer lining of the oyster that you can see in the shucked one. And this is actually what's responsible for secreting the shell. Um, and so it's the same thing in other shelled organisms. And then they have this gooey like chunk of organs, which we call the visceral mass. Um, so these are characteristics of all mollusks. The big difference between these and other shelled ones, aside from the fact that they have um, two valves, is the way that they develop. So we'll talk a little bit later in um, my talk about their, their larval stages. Um, but one of the biggest things is that because these guys have two shells and they, they lack that predominant foot that other snails have is they're predominantly non-mobile. So they're stuck to the bottom. And as a result of that, they are filter feeders, which makes them extremely important for water quality. Another reason oysters are important is that they're reef building. So similar to corals that build these very large um, reef structures, oysters do the same thing. So as they develop from these teeny little um, juveniles, they continue to grow and their mantle continues to secrete this calcium carbonate shell. And over time, they build up these very large um, reef structures. In a natural setting, oysters really aren't that pretty. Um, so you can see here, um, like when you order an oyster on the half shell, oftentimes the shells are a little bit smoother because um, they've been tumbled in bags to break some of those rough edges. Um, they've been cleaned off of all of these epibionts so they look a little bit better. Um, but these epibionts are actually one of the reasons why oysters are really important to coastal ecosystems. So if you look closely at this natural oyster, there's actually a lot of different um, things we can see living in here. So way back in here, we have some sponge. Um, there's actually boring sponges that dig into the shells of the oysters. There's barnacles, there's these worm burrows and other mollusks like um, jingle or slipper shells that live actually on the oyster shell itself. So oysters, because of this like reef building characteristic of them, they're thought of as the ecosystem engineers. So basically they're modifying their habitat. Um, so normally you would just have this kind of mucky bottom, but because the oysters are there, there's this rock-like structure that things can grow on or settle. And so you tend to get much higher diversity in things like corals, sponges, algae um, will actually grow on the reef itself. And then you have lots of little critters that will hide out um, in these various different crevices or use this as a nursery. So oyster reefs actually help to improve, improve species diversity in areas where they're found um, because they have this biogenic reef building structure. Oysters are also really important because they're a food source. So not just for humans, a lot of the research that's done on them is because of aquaculture, but they um, are very important species for many other marine organisms. So if this wasn't um, a webinar and I could actually interact with you guys, I would quiz you on your knowledge of all of these shells, um, which I'm assuming all of you know, but um, there are multiple different snail species, especially in Florida, that are important predators of oysters themselves. So things like oyster drills, conchs, and whelks all feed on oysters, so they're predatory. They have this elongated proboscis, which is basically their jaw that they use to physically drill a hole into the oyster shell, and then they basically digest the oyster um, alive. So there's a bunch of other things that prey on oysters too, so things like birds, crabs, sea stars, and even fish. Um, so they're really important part of the food chain. And we'll come back to this um, a little bit later, but predation by some of these mollusks is actually really important um, in determining the health of the oyster reefs. 
And one of the things that tends to happen is when the oysters aren't doing very well, that predation tends to increase. Um, so these guys can actually be really problematic for the oysters themselves. But thinking back again real quick to why we care about oysters and kind of the point of this talk is that oysters are really important. I need to mute this. Um, because they're capable of filtering water. So this is a time lapse video um, that was put together by the Chesapeake Bay organization. And you can see over time, you kind of have this murky water. And as time passes, the water gets clearer and clearer and clearer. And so what's happening is these oysters themselves are actually taking the water into their mantle cavities. So they have their two shells. They have these really strong um, currents that they can generate over their gill. So the gill they use for respiration, but it's also for feeding. And so they pull particles into the shell and the gills actually have little cilia that sort these particles out. And so particles that are really big tend to get sent back out um, of the oyster. Particles that are smaller will actually get ingested. And then some get trapped in mucus and eliminated in what's known as pseudofeces. So oysters basically are acting as filters for our water. They can help to increase um, water clarity. They can take out um, toxins and pollutants either by storing them in their tissues themselves or by just moving them into the sediment. So kind of taking them um, out of the water. And so because of that, um, ecosystems are kind of dependent on the productivity of oysters and their filtration capacity. There's different um, numbers I've seen of how much one oyster can filter. Some places say that a single oyster can filter up to 50 gallons of water a day, which is probably pretty extreme. Um, but one oyster itself can definitely filter um, a couple of gallons if conditions are favorable. So if we think about the fact that you have hundreds of oysters, hundreds of thousands of oysters in a reef, um, there's a very strong potential um, for these guys to filter the water out. And I'm sure um, many of you guys have heard stories from other places along the East Coast, like in the Chesapeake Bay, um, the Hudson River, or the Mississippi, where they're having lots of issues or lots of issues with water quality because of pollution. And one of the things that's happened in those ecosystems is that all of the oysters have died off because basically the water quality has gotten too bad. And once that happened, the whole ecosystem collapsed. And so oysters and their filtering kind of helped to keep um, these ecosystems functioning and thriving, even if conditions are a little bit subfavorable. So there's a lot of efforts going on to try to restore oysters into these systems to try to help get things back um, up and running. So things haven't gotten this bad yet in Southwest Florida, but we do have a general awareness for kind of how important these things are. Um, and kind of aware of the fact that we've been removing them from um, their natural populations, either because of dredging or just other human activity. Um, and so we wanna to try to make sure that these populations are staying around and healthy so that we don't end up um, like these other areas that have their whole- Hey, Melissa, sorry, this is yeah. Sam. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. I know I said to save all questions to the end, but I'm, I'm interrupting here, I'm breaking my rule because a <laughs> question came up that was specific to that last slide, yeah. which was, how much time passes over the time lapse video? Ooh, that I don't know. Um, I can look it up when we take a break and I finish. I'm guessing it's probably a day or so. Um, that actually might be a little bit faster because it's in a tank. But yeah, they can they can filter like quite a bit of water in just the course of an hour. So I would suspect that that's probably like over the course of a day that they're they're cleaning that up. Okay, thanks, sorry. Yeah, yeah no problem. <laughs> okay, um, so where do we find oysters? Basically, they're found all over the coast. Typically, they're in shallow bays um, along the East Coast. And this is really important because of their filtration capacity. They're kind of working to filter out all of the water that's coming um, from runoff that might be polluted or have problems before it gets out into the open ocean where you tend to have organisms that are a little bit more sensitive to um, environmental changes. Um, in Southwest Florida, they used to be a lot more abundant. So I've heard stories about how oysters 
basically were so thick that you couldn't get boats up the Caloosahatchee, whether or not that's true. I don't know. I just moved here, but it's what I've been told. Um, but basically they're found in any shallow or intertidal habitat. These habitats tend to be naturally really dynamic. So because it's an estuarian system, again, I'm sure a lot of you guys are probably familiar with this, but you get influences of freshwater and influences of the salt water that are mixing together. And a lot of marine organisms are pretty sensitive to that. Oysters are not one of those organisms. Um, the temperature can also really change because the temperature in rivers is gonna be different than what it is um, in the bay or in these intertidal systems, sometimes they're actually exposed to air. Um, but oysters in general, because of where they live, are pretty good at dealing with fluctuating conditions. If we think about something like Junonia that lives in deeper water offshore, um, they need pretty stable conditions. And so if anything strayed a little bit from the norm, it would probably have a pretty significant impact on their health. Whereas oysters, you can do lots of stuff to them um, and put them in pretty crappy water and they can hang out for a long time before they start to die off. So one of the reasons that we use them to study or kind of as an indicator of the overall health of the ecosystem is if they start doing bad, that's a pretty good sign that things are going south pretty quickly um, and that we should try to figure out what it is so that we don't have these ecosystem um, declines. So just to kind of give you an idea of how tolerant um, these guys are, if you think about an oyster that you've eaten, if it's coming from like New England or the West Coast, um, these oysters were taken out of the water, packaged up into a box on ice, so no longer in water, um, shipped across the country, unpackaged, and then probably sat on ice or in a freezer for quite a few days. They can tolerate temperatures um, of freezing for at least a couple of days. Temperatures of around 110 degrees Fahrenheit I actually think that this is water temperature, which is pretty crazy. Um, so at their air temperatures, they probably can withstand a little bit higher. Um, they can withstand really wide ranges of salinity. So salinity of five is probably what you would find up near like Fort My downtown Fort Myers. Um, and 40 part per thousand is even more concentrated than what you have in the ocean. Um, they can be live outside of air for up to, or live outside of the water for up to two weeks. They can live a couple of days without oxygen. They can be exposed to pretty high concentrations of metal, oils, and other pollutants, um, and they still don't die. A lot of these studies that were done in isolated um, conditions, and so the oysters are kind of exposed to just one stressor. And this is pretty unrealistic of what's happening um, in nature. So when we think about changes to our environment, um, in the summer it might be really hot, but that's gonna be accompanied with lots of fresh water from rain. And so you have these multiple stressors that are actually are what are causing um, the problems for these oysters. And so when you start packing on different stress, just like people, um, the oysters health tends to go down. And so this is just kind of a general um, diagram of how different stressors can interact with one another. And the graph is not very intuitive. So I'm going to explain it a little bit. Um, but if we have any stressor, so let's say stressor A is temperature and stressor B is salinity. Um, if an animal is exposed to that stressor, it's gonna have some sort of impact on their performance. So let's say growth. So if temperature causes growth rates to decrease by like 20%, that's not great. If salinity causes, low salinity causes um, growth rates to decrease by 20%, also not great, but that's kind of what happens when they're separate. If you put them together, there's three different scenarios kind of of what can happen. You can get what's known as an additive effect where basically it, um, the detriment kind of doubles. So you might have a 40% decrease in growth. There are actually some scenarios where things get better, um, which doesn't happen a lot, but it does happen. Or what's more common is we get what are known as synergistic effects. And so these stressors actually interact in a way that cause things to go way worse. Um, and so instead of maybe causing like 50% de decreases in growth, it's causing like 80%. So basically they're shutting down. One of the things that happens um, in addition to this is oysters are animals just like us. So when you get stressed out, you tend to get immunocompromised. So all of your energy is going to dealing with these stressors and trying to make sure that like your body is still functioning. And that leaves you open to all of these other um, 
potential like things that can happen. And so in oysters, um, one of the things that we often see in poor water quality conditions is that we have increased susceptibility to disease. So there's multiple different diseases that oysters can get. One of the most common ones is what's known as dermo disease. Um, and I know this is kind of small, it doesn't really matter, but there's um, a little protist called Perkinsis that will infect these oyster tissues and they lay these spores in there and it actually causes a tissue wasting disease. And so um, if the oysters get infected with this disease, basically it just causes them to like lose all their tissue mass and eventually they die. Um, and then another thing that happens, as I kind of alluded to before, is it makes them more susceptible to predation. Um, and we'll come back to this a little bit later. This was actually a picture taken from one of my um, not so healthy um, oyster sites where you can see these crown conchs are all over um, the oysters where predation pressure um, actually increases. Um, this can lead to a negative feedback loop. And so one thing that's also kind of um, interesting that tends to happen is that poor water quality tends to kill off some of the top predators or make them go away. And so things that maybe eat uh, crown conchs or crabs predators of oysters are no longer there. And so these guys will actually explode um, in population numbers. And so not only are the oysters more susceptible to pred predators, there's actually more predators there to eat them. And so it just kind of keeps um, feeding off each other. Another thing that tends to happen when oysters um, are stressed out is that they close up. So their number one line of defense is to isolate themselves from their environment. And what happens when they're isolating is that they're not filtering water. And so anytime you stress out an oyster, how much water they filter becomes less and less. And so again, if we're thinking about this in terms of water quality, if poor water quality is what's leading to the oysters being stressed out and the oysters can help increase or improve water quality, um, they're not gonna be able to, to perform that um, ecosystem service because they're kind of in a bad place themselves. Well, it's kind of a long introduction. Um, probably way too long, but this is like kind of what's um, fueling what I'm interested in this work. And so when I came to FGCU, um, I was hired to be our oyster ecologist. And I think the ultimate goal of anyone who works with oysters is trying to working towards, towards um, restoration projects, right? So we want to like try to fix the problems that we've caused um, and get things back on track. And so I don't know if it was my background working with mussels or maybe just ignorance, but I started thinking about whether or not oyster restorations really work. If we have all of these populations locally that are dying, if we just put more oysters out there, aren't they gonna continue to die? So basically we're trying to restore a broken um, ecosystem. And so one of the things that I wanted um, to study was to try to figure out what some of these stressors are. Um, so this is something I've only been working on for the last six months, so we don't have a lot of data, um, but basically there's probably a lot of different things that are causing oysters to be stressed out in Southwest Florida, and they're probably pretty different depending on which system you're in. So Acero Bay um, we're using as our study system, one, because there aren't, there isn't like a big effort um, to study oysters really intensively. Acero Bay Aquatic Preserve tries to, but they've got a lot of other projects that they're working on. Um, and our marine station is based out of um, Benita Springs. And so it's our kind of like local ecosystem. Um, and Acero Bay is kind of different from the other systems. So you've all heard that one of the problems with oysters um, or just ecosystems in Southwest Florida in general are freshwater releases from Lake O. Um, and so the fresh water comes in, it's bringing all of these pollutants, um, it's causing harmful algal blooms, it's killing off the oysters. But the oyster populations in Estero Bay are not doing well, and Estero Bay isn't really influenced by what's happening in the Caloosahatchee. So those freshwater releases from Lake O really aren't having any impact on the water here. Um, so any of the stressors that are being encountered are coming from probably coastal development. Um, Estero Bay is kind of this weird hydro um, dynamic system where the northern part of the bay acts very different um, than the southern part of the bay. And so when I started to, to think about what I wanted to look at, um, the oyster reefs in the northern part of the bay seem to be doing a lot better than the oyster reefs in the southern part of the bay. And so I was kind of taking a comparative approach being like, if we can look at something that's healthy and then look at something that's not healthy, theoretically, we should be able to find 
what the difference is between them um, in terms of water quality. When I was picking my sites, I also noticed that even within like a small localized area that we would see differences in reef quality over really small spatial scales. And so what I ended up doing was picking these five different sites. So I have three sites up in the Horseshoe Keys, which are kind of just inland from Fort Myers Beach. Um, all of my sites have really terrible names <laughs> based on either what they look like or um, lack of creativity, I guess. But um, so one of the first sites we found we call Horseshoe Dead because it doesn't look like it's doing very well. And it's this small little reef that has like one mangrove on it. Um, very close to it is this other larger reef system um, that's kind of oriented north south rather than kind of like um, the circular region that seems to be doing really well. And then another reef that's part of this like long um, mangrove chain also close by that's a little bit more closer to Hendry Creek, which is where we have um, freshwater influxes coming into the northern part of the bay. Um, so kind of looking at these three sites and seeing how they, they differ between them. We have one site that's just south of Mound Key, which we call Lonely Mangrove Island. And this site is actually probably our healthiest site that we look at. So it's this huge circular reef. There's always fish. Um, we've seen horseshoe crabs there. Tons and tons and tons of different organisms are always um, on this reef. So it's really fun to go to. And then we have our saddest um, site, as the name suggests, the Bar of Despair, which is down in Fish Trap Bay um, in the southern part, which, as the name implies, um, is not really doing very well. And so one of the things that we're looking at um, is how water quality differs between these sites and then what effect that's actually having on oyster health. So a lot of times when people are doing oyster monitoring, they're just going out and looking at the reef and seeing whether oysters are dead or alive and if there's things that are living on it. Where I'm kind of taking a different approach where I wanna look at what the oysters themselves are doing and whether or not they seem to be stressed out by these various different um, parameters. So we have these sensors that we put out, um, which are continuous temperature and salinity um, sensors. So they're taking measurements every 15 minutes that tell us um, how these parameters are changing. And at each of my sites, I have two of these sensors. So I have one that sits basically at the top of the reef. Um, so this would be what those more intertidal oysters are experiencing. And then we have one that's almost always underwater except for extreme tides, which is kind of at like the bottom part of the reef. So the idea behind this was looking at like over the course of the oyster reef, are we seeing differences in like what kind of stressors they're experiencing? Um, and then if that varies between sites. And then we're also looking at things like nutrients, so phosphate and nitrate. So do we have some of these like pollutants from runoff that are coming in and affecting these? Turbidity, which is suspended sediment. So if there's actually too much stuff in the water, it can clog the gills of the oysters and cause them um, to die or at least stop feeding. And then chlorophyll. So they're because they're filter feeders, these guys are eating um, algae that's in the water. So we wanted to see maybe if there's differences in their food, um, that could be related to the nutrients or temperature and salinity at these different sites. And then for our oysters themselves, we're looking at, are they growing? Um, of the individual oyster themselves, do they look emaciated or are they kind of like bulky and putting on um, gamete? Whether or not they're being parasitized by um, that parasite Perkinsis. And then um, what we're just starting to look at is whether or not larvae are actually settling back onto these sites. So to go through some of my data, again, some of it, a lot of it's really preliminary. Um, and it was all taken through the dry season. So this isn't probably um, very representative of what we'll see as we continue to monitor over the course of the year. Um, but one of the things that's not really surprising, um, if we look at temperature, these oysters are ex experiencing pretty extreme um, temperature ranges. So you can see in some instances, it was like 10 degrees Celsius. In other cases, it would be as high as 35. So that's a 25 degree Celsius or like 70 degree difference in temperature, um, which can cause lots of stress. Um, but this was at um, that top, or, top intertidal site. The oysters that are underwater most of the time see much smaller fluctuations. And so if you're under the water and not in these intertidal zones, the temperature tends to range or um, vary only about five degrees. Whereas if you're in those areas where you actually go out of water, the temperature can change 25 degrees. 
Um, and so just across the reef itself, you're going to have different levels of stress that these oysters are experiencing, which I think is really cool um, and something I want to look into more once we see what happens um, through the wet season. Salinity, this graph is not that pretty. Um, so this was data that was collected, like I said, through the dry season, so March through June. Um, and these are only three of our sites. So we have blue is Horseshoe, the Horseshoe Keys. So this is up um, in the northernmost part of the bay. Lonely Mangrove was kind of the middle near Mountain Key. And then the Bar of Despair is our sad site um, in the southern part of the bay. And one of the things that I think is really interesting here is you get differences in salinity, which is expected in an estuary. Um, but the Bar of Despair, which tends to be our, our like least healthy site, seems to have the most um, variable salinity. And so if you look at what's happening at these two, the salinity vari variation might be between like 30 and 33. So only a couple part per thousand. Whereas in um, Fish Trap Bay, the salinity is going anywhere from um, like 22 up to 32. So a much wider range of salinities that these organisms are having to um, deal with. And unfortunately our sensor stopped working here. So um, we don't have data for the rest of that, but I imagine that these trends will look the same. And one thing that I expect to happen as we continue to monitor um, is that as it starts to rain, these numbers are gonna get a lot more extreme. Um, and so all of these combined can have really big impacts on, on how well the oysters are doing. The next couple of slides I'm gonna show you don't really make um, a lot of sense yet. So we're hoping to get more data, but one of the things that we were looking at is kind of like how um, girthy these oysters are. And so one of the things that we would do is dissect them out. So we'd collect oysters from the reef, um, dissect out all their tissue and dry them, and actually look at how much of that is actually like oyster material. Um, so this guy's pretty um, healthy looking. So you can see there's like lots of tissues. There's sometimes where you'll dissect an oyster and there's like not really anything in there. Um, and so what we're doing is looking at like based on how long their shells are or kind of how old they are, like how much of this tissue mass they actually have. And one of the things that's really interesting that we found is that our healthiest site, which is Lonely Mangrove right here, um, the oysters tend to have like a smaller um, biomass to shell ratio, whereas um, the ones that like our bar of despair actually seem to be putting on more tissue, um, even though the reef itself doesn't seem to be doing well. So I don't really understand what's going on there yet. And it'll be really interesting to see um, possibly how that changes. Kind of along the same lines, we've been looking at um, infection rating by Perkinsis. So Perkinsis, like I said, is that um, parasite that puts all these spores into the oyster tissues. Um, and so when you stain them, they kind of swell up and they can be in very, very high numbers. And at our like little sad site that's down in the southern part of the bay, we tend to find really high um, infection ratings, but they also seem to be pretty high at some of our healthy sites. So we're getting some, some conflicting information. A lot of people say that the, the parasites tend to do better when the salinity is higher, and this is our lowest salinity site. Um, so there's a lot of questions that are gonna be building off this, and it'll be really interesting to see um, what patterns emerge over the next um, couple of years. But what I've learned so far is that things seem to be <laughs> a lot messier and a lot more complicated um, than kind of what you hear about. And so one of the things that I think that's happening, which is, is gonna be true for other sites, is that there's a lot of different factors that are playing into this. So the temperature and salinity fluctuations in a sterile bay are probably the same as they've always been. You might have a little bit more freshwater runoff from like changes in the hydrology, but adding in um, nutrients or pollutants are gonna maybe just push the, push the oysters a little bit more over the edge. Um, that bar of despair site is where we see lots of the um, crown conch are basically all over the reef. It looks like an infestation. Um, they tend to be really highly parasitized with worms. And so the other stuff that seems to be in the water, what we haven't quite pinned down yet, um, seems to be causing at least more problems for those sites than at some of our healthier sites that are getting more regularly um, flushed with the Gulf. So maybe next summer I can give you guys another talk and we'll, I'll have more to, to share with you. Um, and I know I'm kind of going over, so I wanna talk real quickly just cause um, it's local. So I've also been working on another project 
um, with SCCF, which is looking at kind of a different aspect of this. So um, one of the things that we kind of alluded to but didn't talk about is oyster larvae. So oysters, um, when they develop, they're broadcast spawners. So they shoot eggs and sperm into the water. And their larvae spend about two to three weeks developing in the water column. And because these are tiny little microscopic planktonic animals, they're basically at the mercy of the currents. And so um, in the Caloosahatchee, one of the things that we're concerned, and particularly Dr. Mildebrandt um, at SCCF, um, is that when these freshwater releases from Lake Okeechobee happen during the spawning season, which is in the summer months, um, there's the potential to actually flush all of those oyster larvae out of San Carlos Bay and out into the Gulf of Mexico. So whether or not oyster restoration projects or oyster reefs in general are going to be successful is going to depend on whether or not the larvae are actually settling back out on these reefs. And so one of the things that we're monitoring is um, larval dispersal, so where the larvae are in the water column and then where they're actually settling. And so there's 10 different sites that we monitor. We actually added another one that's up near um, Cape Coral this year um, or this summer that we're working on. And we're trying to see, um, are the oysters settling? So these are pictures of oyster spat. There are these cute little um, shell guys that are, they have this um, aggregating behavior. So this is how they, they build up those reefs. And then we have um, a group of students who are working to sort um, plankton samples and actually pull out some of the bivalve larvae. And then I'm working on using um, genetics to actually identify them as oysters as opposed to clams um, or mussels or, or one of any of the other shelled organisms um, that are possibly in there. And so we're building a model to try to look at what's driving larval distributions um, in San Carlos Bay and how those Lake Okeechobee um, releases might be influencing it. So really cool project. Um, that SCCF is doing and I have been fortunate enough to help out on. So this work, I definitely did not do by myself. I have a slew of students um, who help me. So Marlon and Stephanie and Alex uh, basically go out on the boat with me every time, help me collect samples, and then they do um, the majority of the lab work. There's a bunch of other students who have helped with the oyster monitoring in Estero Bay. And then a group of students who have been working on the um, project with SCCF and Dr. Milbrand and Felix shows um, at FGCU and then other people that have helped contribute. So thank you for listening to my talk and about my research and I will be happy to take questions. Thank you very, very much, Melissa. And I, oh my God, I love your reef names. <laughs> We Those were are fantastic. We, better we, one. <laughs> yeah, no, no. What was it? the bar of despair? You know, I didn't but, name that one. Another another professor did. I wish I could take credit for it. But oh, that's great. That, that reminds me of um, you know where I find myself at the end of the night in college. You know? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was great. Thank you. Um, and great pictures and um, the images are terrific. I hadn't I hadn't seen the whole presentation. It's really really great. Um, and we have some questions here, which I will go to our chat function here. Um, we have a question from Arlene. Um, are you familiar with the Oyster Recovery Partnership in Maryland? And is that something that might be beneficial for Southwest Florida? Um, I am not familiar with that one in particular. So I'm kind of new to the oyster game. So I've been learning a lot about oysters over the last couple of months. I know that um, VIMS in uh, Virginia has a really big um, organization. There's the Billion Oyster Group, I think that's based out of New York. Um, but I will definitely look into that. I think oyster restoration in general is something that people are trying to work on. So there's SCCF has done a couple of restorations. Um, there was a professor at FGCU who did restorations, I think back in like 2008 before I got here. Um, and then there's groups down in Naples that are working on it. It's just, it's one of those things that it's, it's a lot of work to actually like put in and a lot of money. Um, and then it's kind of hard to assess whether or not they actually work for a really long time. Mm -hmm. And the, the water quality in Southwest Florida now isn't that bad. 
um, that we really need it. So I think that it's something that's definitely good and we should work towards. And I think that, that we could have a lot of, um, there's a lot of benefit to definitely of working with these groups who've done it on much larger scales than we have. Um, I just don't know that that Southwest Florida is there yet. There's parts of the Northern Gulf that definitely um, would benefit from that because the Mississippi is kind of killing off everything. Uh -huh. But I will I will look into that. Okay. Okay. And then there's a question from Callie who, um, and you may have just sort of addressed some of this, but can you tell us about how we can help to make recovery efforts? So you just talked about some of that in some of the organizations, but would there be anything to expand on for that? Yeah, so I think the biggest thing with recovery efforts with water quality is just being kind of mindful of what we're all doing. So a lot of people like to point blame on um, like Lake Okeechobee, for instance, and how that's being poorly managed and that's what's causing all of the problems. And the reality is that we're developing these pretty fragile ecosystems. Um, there's lots of golf courses that are using algicides in their ponds um excess of of nutrients and all or fertilizers and all of this is running off into our bays and contributing to the problem so just trying to be mindful a mindful kind of consumer um and thinking about like if you can use um less toxic alternatives or detergents that aren't maybe going to cause harmful alcohol blooms um would be a good solution there are a lot of um, people I know who are also starting to do like dock oyster reefs, um, which I think can be a really beneficial thing um, on smaller scales, as long as you make sure that they're not like breaking down and releasing a bunch of plastic or <laughs> trash into the water um, and then causing more problems. But yeah, I think the biggest thing is uh, just kind of trying to, to limit what waste we're putting into the water itself. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the, your last point you mentioned there was was cyber clairvoyant in a way, because actually a, a question <laughs> just came in on chat as you were talking where Richard was wondering um, if we can cultivate oysters at our docks. And the answer is yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Great. Um, a question from Isabel. Uh, has anyone been monitoring the quantity of microplastics filtered by oysters? Not at FGCU yet. Um, it's something that we're definitely working towards. Thing with microplastics is that they're actually really hard to study. Um, we found evidence, um, Dr. Pusbag Kiri is working on microplastics um, and looking at microplastics and sediments in San Carlos Bay. And they found pretty high quantities. And so I'm sure that the oysters and other organisms are, are taking these up. Um, whether or not those are having effects on them is really hard to study because to study them, you actually have to make microplastics and put them into the water, which makes it worse <laughs> in some ways. Um, and so it's something that we're, we're interested in doing and studying. And it's definitely something that's like on the, on the forefront of our research that we'll probably be moving into too. It's just trying to find a way to do it without actually like making microplastics in the environment worse. Mm -hmm. Okay, and a comment here from Julie. I have always heard that oysters are best eaten in a month with an R in the name. I live near the Chesapeake Bay. <laughs> yeah, so um, I can't remember what it is. I think it just has to do with the temperature. Um, so the, the prevalence of like um, paralytic shellfish poisoning or some of these parasites that oysters will get tend to be higher when the temperatures are warmer. And so in the summer months or the months that don't have R, um, you just tend to have oysters that are more diseased. They're, I mean, they're kind of a gross animal if you think about it. They're filtering everything that's out of the water. There's all sorts of things that live on them and in them. Um, some of those make them taste better, but um, I think well, just one of the reasons to avoid that is because the temperatures are so warm that the oysters are metabolizing really quickly. And so it makes them pick up um, some of those those parasites more. I think that's particularly related to paralytic shellfish poisoning. So you don't want to get that. Okay. <laughs> well, one more question from um, uh, Raymond. Uh, can you use bagged oyster shells under docks to encourage new oyster development? Yeah, um, that would definitely work. One of the things that I think 
most people find problematic is when you, when you start putting them out, other stuff will settle on them and mostly barnacles. So barnacles for any of you that have docs, I'm sure have, are always kind of a nightmare because they, they biofoul everything. Um, and they will grow, like even when we put out oyster shell, there sometimes we'll go out and the oyster shells are just covered completely with barnacles. Like we scrape barnacles off of oysters all of the time. Um, and so you definitely can use bagged oysters. I would, um, a lot of times like in aquaculture settings, they'll like shake them or flip them um, or even take them out of the water for a little bit of, of the time and put them back in, which will kill off some of the other stuff. Uh, but just know that you're probably going to be attracting some other things with it that you may not may not want. But there's really no way around that. Barnacles go everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much, Melissa, for for the wonderful talk. Thank you, everybody, for the for the good questions and yeah, for <laughs> participating <laughs> and joining. And. Um, uh, join us again in a couple of weeks for, for a supersized squid talk. Um, go to the museum's website to learn more. And uh, thank you again and have a great night. Thank you.